If you look at Gene Bank, Gene Bank has moved on as well. Gene Bank is no longer about me finding a sequence, you finding a sequence. Use of those sequences so that researchers can actually interrogate and interact with each other. The same is going to happen with clinical research. I think we are behind our scientific colleagues who have already taken a major step in making their results available, which actually in gigabytes are a lot larger than we will ever generate. Uh, but we need to do the same. And I hope in future I'll be able to convince Jim and Pushit to make the IRCC data available in an anonymized fashion on the BJU website. What is there to hide? Why should it not be out there? Why are we presenting means and medians and God knows what else? Why is the raw data not out there for you to look at? It should be, shouldn't it? So I hope, Jim, that's where we are going. Um, here in the U.S., there's a, um, a lot of competition for healthcare dollars, um, uh, kind of a different climate that you would see over in the U.K. And some healthcare systems publish their outcomes, like their outcome research, you know, so um, a patient who is shopping around for therapy um, can say, well, if I go to this institution, this is their success rate and things like that. Um, in the climate that we have here in terms of robotics and things like that, what is your feeling about just having open access for patients to see what your outcomes are, you know, for robotics or whatever other surgeries that you do? The problem is, uh, you know, it's a great question. The problem is it requires brave men and women whose livelihood might depend on it. It is rare for me to hear an American colleague actually talk about their death rates. Very rare. Maybe I'm being critical here, but it is very rare because their livelihoods, I believe, depend on it. We do have such a forum where inside a closed room, colleagues from the United States have the ability to discuss their data openly. And that forum is called the Slugfest. It happens at the AUA every year and stands for the Southern Laparoscopic Urology Group Festival. The Southern Laparoscopic Urology Group was a group of urologists in the south of London, myself included, four of us, who formed this group 10 years ago. And the aim of it was behind closed doors, without being critical of anyone, to discuss our complications and to then peer review and learn from it. It remained behind closed doors. No one ever stepped out and talked about them. We started inviting colleagues from the United States, and the great and the good have come. Ralph Clayman, Indabir Gill, Jeff Kadedu, they've all been there. Believe me, at the Slugfest this year, which happened on the Saturday of the AUA, if you heard those complications, you'd be shocked. We were not there to criticize our colleagues. We are there to learn from each other. The only way you can learn at this time is to take the fear away from being exposed. In my country, quite the converse. The cardiac surgeons have already done it. There was a major crisis in Bristol in the 80s where a number of children died after open heart surgery. That led to the government putting the term clinical governance in and making sure that the cardiac surgeons had national databases paid for by the government, national data managers, whereby anybody, any patient on the road can interrogate your data, my data, and compare everyone else. There's nothing hidden. It's all out there. Is it going to happen in the United States in a hurry? I don't think so. Is it going to happen in Slugfest? It sure does every year. And it's a very entertaining and honorable place to be in, behind closed doors. Okay, what does the haptic interface feel like? Fabulous. Like, so, it, are you wearing a glove? Uh, how, how are you sensing it? Cu currently, I see it on a monitor. Okay. The future will be 
on these air cushion arms. So you have an exoskeleton, you put your hands through the exoskeleton and you can feel the differences in the air cushion on your fingers. Uh, and I was surprised, Jim. I, I thought that if I couldn't feel anything with my fingers, which I thought were the most sensitive things around, then they didn't exist. They do. My finger just does not have the ability to feel them. Uh, this probe does as long as the depth uh, is 8 mm or less. Uh, I have two questions. So how do you differentiate between transiting a surgeon from one skin to the other with a tremendous domain knowledge and uh, a training of the resident. Like this, I'm dealing with a surgeon who has that ele who does 1100 softwares in, 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 in a year. He needs to be transformed to robotic surgeon. Now, I don't think personally uh, putting him through the same cycle and sending him to animal lab just to see the blood in the soft tissue makes much sense to me. Uh, how do you differentiate between a resident and a fellow going to Escalita, which you have elaborated from? Like all of us have done, some way or the other, from open to endoscopy to laparoscopy to robotics. In the emerging data, and I didn't show this because uh, I didn't want to go into unpublished detail. The emerging data on learning curve, the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of learning curve is this. Say it takes this experienced surgeon to learn the same procedure robotically in 20 cases. And you, an experienced surgeon, would know as to how many it takes such a person to learn. If you then look at the standard deviation on this, it would probably be between 16 and 24. Now if I tell you that I can halve that learning curve to 10, then you would save money and it would be safer not just for the surgeon, but his learning curve and those patients who he is learning. So the answer to your question is, despite it all, I would put such a surgeon at least for two or three procedures in an igloo with a robotic simulator and a team around him. I wouldn't just put him on a robotic simulator to practice in a dry environment. I would put him in an igloo and put him through the stresses of operating with a team, even if, even if it is for two procedures, because that will shorten his learning curve by halving it. I think that is very useful, despite him or her being an experienced surgeon. Jeffrey, do you, you, before you went to the from the technical to the cognitive aspect, you showed uh, a, a graph with some Likert curves that are all at four and a half or so. That was for for the simulation. Did did you go to the next step though to have these guys start doing TRBTs and demonstrate that they were better? Did, was that what Correct. that said? Correct. So I mean, that, that's the whole. You know, you could simulate the heck out of the thing, but still you have to demonstrate. In a, in a randomized fashion, yeah. maybe? So it, wants it has to be a repetitive process, and the NIHR have just uh, given us a uh, shot of five million to run that where there is a two-year run-in nationally, because, you know, launching something like this, even on a small island, in different centers, and have the buy-in from surgeons who are inherently technicians is not easy. So the first two years, is to establish the grassroots. Actually, that work is already done. You could easily have people from within government saying, simulation is a good thing. We are trying to improve patient safety. That is the evidence, Money Menon style. Actually, the evidence is not that good. It stops at construct validity. It does not have predictive validity. And then the other thing, in Dr. Padari's example, he has a guy who does 1,100 sapodectomies. You, you don't have your sapodectomy model. No to simulate yet. So Correct. this guy is, is out ahead of that curve. Correct. And you know, does he sit at the simulator? You know, I think it probably still is useful at least get the... He gets that. And I think what is even more useful is surrounding him with the ego. Because he will not get that just sitting on a robotic simulator. Because he will move you know, little rings from here to there. He will do some suturing. Uh, but he will not get that working within a team environment sure. and right. being stressed within a yeah. team right. environment. I guess. But then, 
you know, is he going to move rings around in the igloo, waiting for the esophagus? Yeah. He, to be he can move whatever he likes around, because on the computer outside the igloo, we will be stressing him in other ways. And he won't know until he walks into the igloo as to what stresses he's going to face. So his response to those stresses will be unusual. Listen, when I first went in, I thought I was a great guy, you know, marathon runner, great guy. The mistakes I made were subtle but significant. I felt stressed. I would rather feel stressed inside an igloo uh, than actually when I'm operating on my Yeah, I think uh, the, for this particular situation, the best model would be to have Stacy in your scrub with him for three cases. Yeah. The, the point which is very really important, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, we have a maturing data on 60 such people and the information which I have really intrigues me, doesn't fit in any particular model. And I went back into the antiques of surgical training and one big bubble comes in the passion, in the passion of the surgeon. And when it comes, it plays such a thing. And then I look corollary literature and a gentleman in, from India who is a really cognitive specialist that moved to England, you would have heard of Sugata Mitra. Sure. He's on TED Talks. Sure. And yeah. he says very clearly and has proved with volume pool experiment that education is a self-organizing function. Rest is all facilitated. And how these slum kids have learned high level of computing with no background of whatsoever. So I think what I am trying to extrapolate is that in my case also there were people who were so passionate about doing robotics and they didn't have any formal training because nobody need teach them, person with 5,000 is off, you don't have to teach how he has to be safe with the patient. So what I am trying to say that putting all of them into the same cycle doesn't make much sense. Of course, I don't have majors like you that sometimes if you can come out with the data on simulation to say that X personalized person would need only two cases or one case or securing or ensuring the patient safety by putting the skilled people around him which would be stuck in So with a hand on my heart, I can't give you an answer to that for the next five years. No one can, and anyone pretend, who pretends they can are not being honest. But the fact is, it was very difficult for me as an experienced open and laparoscopic surgeon to accept what I've just shown you, which is why I said to you, this will be difficult. Different people will see this differently. There are trainees here who think this is wonderful. There were equally senior surgeons when I first presented it who absolutely took a gun and shot me in the temple. This is a problem. No one knows the answer. But if you look at the educational background to it, there seems to be some benefit in at least testing the hypothesis with the right tools at hand. So if you ask me in 2012 what I would do, that's what I would do. If you don't have the facilities, clearly you will take the patient, the experienced surgeon through a mentor process where the first person they exper experiment on, sorry to use that word, uh, would be a patient. Hey, how many of us have done that? All of us. Uh, is that good? I don't think so. So when Dr. Mann and I were residents, of course, there was no scope. You know, there, we went through the scope and you do a TURBT or a TURP and then the teacher would look in and see how what you had done and if it was good or bad. So it's amazing how things have really uh, transpired. So to me, a lot of it is just sort of being around and paying attention and 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 simulation. I, and so simulation certainly is evolving at different rates in different centers. But what, what if you, there's been a lot of talk about warm-ups. So and this not so much with open surgery, but with with laparoscopic or robotic surgery. What do you what do you, what do you think about? warming up in the morning before you start your day? <laughs> I think it's a good thing. Uh, in fact, in the ergonomics project that I showed you, uh, again, these are all, uh, what I'm trying to distill are PhD studentships of people who have spent three, four, five years doing this work. Osama El-Hajj looked at warm-up 
versus no warm. The warm up guys uh, perform better and feel less tired. For lap resources. Uh, for, for anything. Lap open robotic. Uh, uh, and he had this unique model where he was testing a group of surgeons warming up and the others just went straight in. It was a quasi randomized uh, study. I didn't show you the data, uh, uh, but no question. So the way I warm up is run six miles most mornings uh, at 5 a.m. Uh, it keeps me fit. It allows me to run a marathon a year. Uh, and every morning with my anesthetist, unless it is pelting with rain, that's how I warm up. I think it's a good thing. But there's that overall physical warm up, then there's the warm up, you know, McDougall and Ellering are doing something where he sits for 20 minutes while they're putting the ports Correct. in and runs through some simulation Correct. stuff. Correct. Uh, again, it's a good thing. I mean, in surgery, just as in athletics, there are people who are innately more gifted than others. I mean, you can spend as much time warming up as Dr. Taylor yeah. or Rafa Nadal, and you avoid it. Most people do. Given that, and I, you know, I think I did. Allowing for that, there is something to be said for passion. I mean, we see trainees who are more passionate about uh, doing things than others. So when, when we do robotics, for example, um, you can learn a lot. <laughs> you can see a lot simply by watching. <laughs> you know, yeah, we are. You know, so we've had a resident who, when they're in room 25, which um, Jim talked about, and they're watching a case, they're on their blackberries. Um, and then you see residents, or nurses for that matter, who watch what is happening and write down every step. We're not telling them not to be on their blackberries, or we're not telling them not to write things down. But generally, there's a correlation with how, how comfortable they are when they start, uh, depending on the passion that they have. Why are you smiling? Absolutely. This, this happened, this ha you published on this document. Yeah. This happened in your own life. Remember your learning curves yes. compared to Ashutosh Tiwari's. Yes. You started at eight hours, yes. your curve went like this, then this. Tiwari started at three and a half hours and yeah. remained like this. Yeah. Uh, that is passion and watching you without actually doing the operation. Right. You it's can't exactly. explain that exactly. purely by the age difference alone. He might, it, age might have had certain, something to do with it, but you cannot explain it purely by age. Only this phenomenon is so subjective, that's why it's not being taken care of. You can't measure it, but I believe that that's very good. I, I do not know, Dr. Bhandari, of any way of measuring passion uh, apart from the Roger phenomenon, uh, Federer phenomenon, where, you know, at the age of 31 he keeps going. He's just gone through into the semi finals of Halle again beating Milos Raonic for the third time, you know, a man 10, 12 years his junior. The only way you can carry it, this happened today, the only, uh, my wife's texting me furiously because we are both mad Federer fans. Uh, the only way uh, you can do this, the only way you can do this uh, at the age of 31 in sports is to have a passion for the sport, just like you do uh, for robotic surgery. You can't measure it. There is no measure for it. Uh, um, it's really nice to see this concept of the virtual operating room and steps. And I, I participate on some education committees within the AUA and we talk about simulation on a level. And the American College Surgeons here has a, a laparoscopy skills based course in it, and we have a version of that in our simulation center which if you haven't been downtown and no one's taking you to that simulation, you need to see it because it looks just like the photos you have with a control room and a, and a mannequin. And we have our Dr. Dolchevsky, who's our chief of the division of surgery, has been very active in, in telemedicine and NASA in simulation. So, so, but to give the relevant example to me is as general surgery residents here, which we all go through, um, they have several of these modules that they mandate and they go through. And when you go through the central venous access module and you read it and everybody kind of knows, you look at the ultrasounds, are you, are you taking an IJ or subclavian or a femoral 
But when they make you go through the simulation, you walk into the room and the door closes behind you. And you have to first prep the patient. You put the little fake you know, thing on there, it's dry, and it's a dried out old chloroflare thing. But then you gotta open up your tray, which is kind of already open with your You have to put on your gown, and your glove, and your mat. And if you forget to put your irrigation syringes, or your caps, or you don't put on your mask, or your cap before you put on your gloves, I mean, that's a problem in the real world. And you can't do that in the real world, but it's the process of having this stepwise going through it. So if you put on the lap train and you cut a little gauze circle out, it doesn't prepare you to do laparoscopic surgery because if you don't have the right ports in the room, and if you set up a situation where the surgeon has to decide, do I have the right ports? Where am I going to put them? It is a different and I think a more comprehensive thought process than can I cut a circle or a square out of, you know, with scissors. And I think that personally, and as I go through my career, and if I have an opportunity to participate in simulation, my goal is to think of a way to recreate a situation where the surgeon has to think from the beginning, from the end, and not just these small technical skill things. Because I would argue those small technical skill aspects, you know, how to do a TUR, you master that when you do your 50th and 150th TUR. But how do you put the scope together? Does your resident know what loop to select? Does he know how to, I mean, does he know how to put the drapes on? What his decisions he's going to make? The, the, that's more important to me in a simulation because he'll do 150 turns and he'll figure out you know, how to, when he wants to stop at the bladder neck. So You're I'm hoping that we all think and critically look at the papers that are being published and ask ourselves, is it really going to add to you know, how someone's prepared to do a surgery? You, you, uh, you've taken the words uh, off me. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I tell you what, when I showed the same BS video uh, in California just three weeks ago where I was VP, the senior surgeons there said, so now you're trying to teach QRP, a robotic surgeon. I mean, how low can you stoop? They completely missed what else I was showing them. That's it. The, sir, the argument went on for 20 minutes. They thought I was a complete joker. I mean, they're probably thinking, and we invited this guy as our VP. He's supposed to be a pretty good shot. How pathetic is this? So let me say this to you. For your scenario, where the surgeon hasn't scrubbed properly, or the anesthetist is about to put a JVP line, we will stress the surgeon by at that point in time, a specialist nurse walking in, when he is 10 minutes through the procedure and has got his or hands splattered with blood that the patient is HIV positive and he missed it. And I can tell you that surgeon is never going to make that mistake again because that's the only time he or she is going to make that mistake. We have done this, exactly this. We can put the stressor, we can write the scenario, we can put the actors in to pretend about what's actually happening. And I tell you, it's very, very stressful. I've been inside this as part of my own training because I first thought I need to learn this myself before I put, it, put others through it. It was extremely stressful, one of the most difficult things I've ever done. Jim. Um, I just was gonna... Uh, make a comment on your slide to C1 simulate many for the next two points, for, yeah. you know, which is obviously based on the C1 do and teach one aphorism. But um, you know, really, C1 is probably not enough. Yeah. You know, you, and that's yeah. you know, that's why Ash Tuari leapfrog Dr. Nine's early learning curve because he saw 50 or 60 or 70 at the company that he'd done before. And I remember when I. I started to learn laparoscopy. We had a, a good case that Dieno had done, which was two hours long. I probably watched it 20 times. And I memorized that case. And I, I knew every step. And I could close my eyes and I could think through every step, how they did, where the instrument came in, what the next step was, what the next step was. And then I started to do some cases. You know, and that, that sort of preparation, if you can do that much, that it doesn't, it's not quite simulating, but it's, I guess, without a simulator is. Jim, thank you for your comments. I'm going to change it to see many. I, I, I completely agree. Well, if there are no further questions, may I, like Jim, invite you to ERAS? Uh, and if nothing, come to ERAS as an excuse, because it's immediately after the Olympics. 
the Olympic village is going to look marvelous. You will love it. The location is superb. And this now is the premier robotic conference in the world. You guys have had your time. You now cannot fill your halls. We are doubling our halls because there is that demand and the love for robotic surgery in Europe that the USA has already experienced. So come to a unique event, if not for any other reason, but to enjoy the post-Olympic Games. Thank you very much again for having me.